Uh, let's start, right? Okay. So we continue from last time. We we're talking about discussing causal effects. And um, so we began last time talking about experiments. And we say that uh, random experimentation is usually a pretty good way to tell us directly what a you know, does, it, does it apply to the schools in China that small classroom is so better? Does it apply to Africa? Where does it apply? In order to understand where does it apply, you need to understand the mechanism. So for example, right, we can have a very simple mechanism, which is small classroom means everybody sitting closer to the blackboard. Now, if sitting closer to blackboard is the only mechanism in which small class will give you better learning outcome, then you know that whatever effect you're getting out of Tennessee should also apply in China, should also apply in uh, Africa, should also apply everywhere in the world, because everywhere in the world, smaller class means sitting closer to the blackboard. However, if you think the mechanism is more complex, suppose the, the reason why small class induce better learning outcome is because teachers use different methodology when teaching. Right? Small class means teachers interact with students more. Uh, probably students do more group work. If that's the reason that small class give you better learning outcome, then okay, then then whatever effect you get out of out of Tennessee probably does not expect China. Because in China, teachers use a different kind of teaching method. Correct? Okay. So in order to know where does the effect apply, so what, what does that mean, we need to understand the underlying mechanism. So we need to think about it, right? So if you say, okay, I don't, how do I ever get to know the underlying mechanism? Well, you always start with some prior knowledge. And then if you, if you know, if, then if you're not sure which mechanism it is, what are the channels that could possibly lead to the observed effect, then that just simply means you need to do more experiments. In whatever case, okay, understanding mechanism is essential for interpreting the results from randomized trials. And when, it, when we're dealing with observational data, it's even more the case. Okay, so uh, that's the point I made last time. And, uh, and last time I also defined uh, some concepts here, right? The first concept I defined is called the scope of a causal effect. That the scope means what are the populations in which a causal effect actually applies. That's called a scope, right? And the causal effects are always, whatever you do, any causal effects we estimate are population specific. It's always specific to a certain population. Now the question is, to what population? Right? To what population does a causal effect apply? It's called the scope of the causal effect. All right, um, now in two different populations, they may have completely different causal effects of x and y. And we can summarize the reason, we can summarize it in two kind of reasons. Uh, so suppose there's population A and a population B, and then we're interested in the causal effect of X on Y, right? Okay. Now, uh, there is something, in every population, there is something called the effect modifier. What is the effect modifier? Effect modifier is anything that may change the, you know, the estimated causal effect of X on Y, right? So as an example, suppose I want to know what is the effect of a fertilizer on the, you know, on the output of a certain crop then temperature effect modifier, okay? Temperature influence the, the effect of fertilizer. Uh, season, all right, rainfall, all these things can influence the effect of fertilizer on crop output. So these things are called effect modifier. So in every population, we have a distribution of effect modifier. Let me call this S. Uh, in B, there's a different distribution of effect modifier S. So when we're talking about causal effect of X on Y, there are two reasons that the causal effect can be different in different populations. The first reason is the mechanism is different. Okay? So the mechanism of x going to y can be completely different in two different populations. Example, decreasing supply, oil supply on gas price. So if, if, you know, for whatever reason that we have a decreasing supply of oil, what is the effect of oil price? Now suppose we're comparing country A versus country B. Now, the causal effect of decreasing oil supply, on oil price, on gas price, can be different in country A or country B. Depends on the mechanism of oil or gas market in the two countries. If country A is a free market, country B is a regulated price market, right? So in country B, for example, government regulates gas price. In country A, it's a free market. Then decreasing oil supply will have very different results on gas price in the two countries. Okay? So the first reason why they're different can be mechanism is different. The second reason why the cause and effect can be different is even if the mechanism is the same, the distribution of so-called effect modifiers are different. There will also be more different effect modifiers. Right? So again, 
the, uh, the example would be, let's consider the causal effect of raising retirement age, um, for example, saving. Okay? So if I raise the retirement age, what is the effect on the Well, because the mechanism of the country A and the country B are exactly the same. But country A has more older people than country B. The distribution is different, then country A, the effect will be different than country B. Right? Just because country has more older people. So the distribution of S also matters. In other words, right, you can think about you can think about the estimated causal effect in a population as this integral of estimated causal of causal effect conditional on the effect modifier and integrated with all kinds of effect modifiers. So as long as the distribution of the effect modifier is different, then even if the mechanism is the same, the the, S, the causal effect will be different. So in order to know, okay, so once you have estimated causal effect. In order to understand where it applies, in order, to, you know, in order to understand what it means and where it applies, you need to know what is the mechanism and what are the effect modifiers. Okay? What are the distribution effect modifiers? You need to know both. And then you can know, okay, in this population it applies, and in that population in that population it may not apply. Okay. Now so uh, so the population on which we do our study is called the study population. And the population, and, and you know, whatever, whatever we want to say about other population, is called target population. If our study is valid, if the estimated causal effect is valid in my own population, like in the population on which my study is performed, we, we say we have internal validity. If the effect is valid outside, if we can potentially say something about other population, it's called external validity. Right? So the ability to have external validity is also called the transportability of causal effect. Right. Now, in the case of Tennessee example, uh, if the causal effect of passing on learning is valid for the Tennessee population, then we say it has internal validity. If we can take this result and apply to China, we say it has external validity. And to judge whether something has internal validity, is de depends on what? Depends on knowing the scope of the causal effect. And knowing the scope of causal effect depends on what? Depends on understanding the mechanism of why that causal effect occurs. Okay, so that's really the key message here. All right. <clears throat> okay, so in summary, uh, understanding the underlying causal mechanism is not only for un necessary for understanding a causal effect, right, what it means, where it applies, but also for determining whether a causal effect we estimate from a study population can be applied to any other populations, all right? Um, and, uh, and in any case, uh, where does the mechanism, where does the, you know, our understanding of the mechanism come from? It comes from our prior knowledge. So as, well, as I will explain later, that the process of causal inference in science is a, is a sort of like a, is a repeated uh, process in which, it's, it's like a Bayesian process, right? In which we base our prior knowledge about the mechanism we estimate causal effects, okay, and understand the causal effects, and then we use that to update our prior information, and then we and then we do the same process again and again. And again. Think about that. I will I will talk more about that later. Right. <clears throat> so here comes uh, a criticism of the RCM. because so far uh, the causal model that I've described is the Rubin causal model, where uh, the treatment X is conceptualized as sort of like experimental treatment, right? So then we y has a potential outcome, y0, y1, these are potential outcomes. So in the Rubin causal model, uh, there's a treatment, and then there are potential outcomes. The treatment is associated with potential outcomes. But how does it, so, like, how do they associate? How do we go from treatment to potential outcome? What is the underlying mechanism? The Rubin causal model doesn't care. Okay. The Rubin causal model says there's x, and there's y, you know, there's x equal to 0, 1, and then there's y0 and y1. So by modeling, uh, causality in such a way, the Rubin causal model doesn't emphasize the importance of mechanism. So that's why, okay, a couple of people, not me, right, uh, more famous people, Ackerman and uh, uh, Vedaso, have criticized the Rubin causal model as underplaying the role of mechanism in causal inference. And uh, for that reason, probably we need a better framework to think about causality, which is something I will introduce later today. Okay, we'll, we'll be talking about causal block model which in my opinion is a better model for this public causality than the Rubin causal model. Okay, but before we talk about that, right, let's, uh, 
uh, let me. I just want to begin today with some more examples uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, in the spirit of the China Sea example, just to further illustrate my point. All right. Um, so let's take a look at uh, one hypothetical example called fumigation and yield. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, do farming, probably not. But <laughs> fumigation is the use of fumigants. Uh, fumigant is something that you can use to get rid of, uh, get rid of uh, how to say. It? The infect, infect, infecting uh, insects. Okay, so uh, we can use fumigant to control uh, worms in the uh, you know in, uh, in farm. So fumigation is the use of fumigant to control worms that affect crop yield. All right. Now suppose we do a randomized control trial. Okay? We do an RCT, the randomized experiment, to study the effect of fumigation on barley yield in a small town in a randomly selected barley field. In, uh, in in this in this town, okay. <laughs> so so this town is called Lamba. No, this, this is actual town, by the way. I, I, I put it from Google. Uh, it, it is the town with the longest name in the entire world. I'm I'm not kidding. Okay, so I think it's Welsh or Scottish town. Okay, um, anyway, let's just go to that town and we select n random fields and we apply fumigation to some of them as treatment and leaving the other things as control. Okay. And then I'm going to sell, and then and I use this experiment to uh, to test the effect of fumigation. So my results come up. Okay, so I do the experiment. My results come up. The result is the fumigation has increased barley yield by twenty percent. So that's a pretty big increase in crop yield. So again, what does it mean? What does this result mean? Does this result mean that fumigation, like this kind of fumigant or fumigation, is good <coughs> for barley? Does this, does this mean that fumigation is good for body, at least? <laughs> okay? Right. What does this result mean? And, and also, where does it apply? Is this 20%? If we do the same thing in China, like, you know, I go to, <coughs> I go to some body, bless you. So I go to some body fields in China, and I do the fumigation. Do I see the 20%? Okay. So does it apply in China? Does it apply to another, you know, some place in America called OK, Oklahoma? That's also a real town, by the way. Um, so where does that apply, and what does it mean? Right? So that's a question that you can only answer if you have some idea about the mechanism of why fumigation increases yield. So that's my point. Um, so, <clears throat> for example, okay. Uh, like I said, the uh, the effect of the causal effect, whether the causal effect uh, is the same in two populations, depends on two things. The first thing is whether the causal mechanism is the same. The second is whether they have the same distribution of, of so-called effect modifiers. All right. So let's think about this case. Okay. Um, let me use uh, so let me use this tau tilde to denote the possible effects in the study population, and let me use this tau to denote the possible effects for any body field in the world. So this tau means if I if I'm able to do a randomized study on all the body fields in the world, okay? Not just in that town, but in all the body fields in the world. The effect that comes out will be this tau. So I'm interested in observing tau tilde. What can it say about this tau, okay? Now, suppose, so let's think about the mechanism, right? So I, I need to know, I need to understand something about how fumigation will affect worms and affect uh, yield. Suppose I'm an expert in agriculture. And I know that the effect of fumigation depends on the season in which a field is fumigated. Okay, so season is effect modifier. Then what does it mean? That means that, now suppose the experiments that I did in that town was conducting in the summer. Then that means the effect I'm getting is actually e tau condition on summer. Do people agree that? Okay. So suppose summer is the effect modifier, season is the effect modifier, and the actual experiment was done in the summer. That all I'm getting from the experiment is the effect of is, is the effect of fumigation in summer only, right? Conditional on summer. So I'm not really getting the you know, I'm not really getting the effect of, the effect in other seasons. I'm only getting the effect in the summer. If I understand that the effect depends on summer, depends on season. Right? Now, uh, suppose, okay, suppose further that the effect of fumigation depends not only on season. But depends on what crop was grown last year, okay, in on the field. Because if last year it was not barley, 
if, if last year in the field was you know, some other crop was grown, then the effect of fumigation may be completely different, for example. So, in, so and, and then in that town, okay, in that Welsh town, in this Welsh town with a ridiculous now name, last year every field was, you know, suppose that last year every, every field was body again. So, so no change, no crop switch, no crop rotation. Then what I'm really getting is the effect of fumigation, conditional on summer, and conditional on no crop switch or no crop rotation. Right? People follow me that, right? In other words, you know, what you are really getting from your experiment can, could, be, could be very different depending on your, your understanding about what matters and what are the factors. Okay? Right. So in other words, uh, the problem with experiments, the problem with in practice many people who do experiments, the problem with their research is they don't think deeply about their, their mechanism and they don't think deeply about what actually matters. So they think they are getting a universal effect. But if it, in reality, what they're getting is a very, is an effect that actually conditional on many things that happen to be true during the experimentation. In this we call, we call this local effects, okay? Local effects means the effect is only valid when these local, when these conditions are satisfied. So it's a local effect, it's not a universal global effect. So understanding mechanisms is very important for you to understand what is the thing that you're actually getting, how local it is, that the effect you are getting. Okay. Uh, so here's a joke. <clears throat> right. Some people have seen that. Uh, psychology, right? Okay, the joke is um, the, the majority, the majority of scientific research in psychology is the study of psychology students. And in particular, the study of psychology students in America. Right? So, so what that means is you know, uh, in psychology, typically the research is done on undergrad students in American colleges, and you just the professor recruits some students, and they do a lab, and they publish a paper out of it. Now, the effect could be only it, it could completely be true that the effect is only valid among those students in that population. Right? It doesn't apply to any other population. In other words, it doesn't really necessarily have the external validity, and that's a huge problem for psychology, for example. Okay, so always understand. Uh, so understanding the scope and the mechanism is very important. All right. Um, so in summary, right, uh, RCTs, randomized experiments, are often considered the gold standard for causal inference. Um, and uh, but however, okay, however, uh, there is a popular but mistaken belief that they require no assumptions on causal mechanism. As we have discussed, okay, uh, I hope I have convinced you. Without understanding or making assumption on mechanism, any causal effect is essentially meaningless. Okay? You can get a causal effect from anything, it's going to be meaningless, even randomized experiments, okay, whether they are produced by random experiments or observational studies. So this is the first reason that uh, doing randomized experiments is often not enough. Okay? We need to dig deeper. There's a second reason, of course, that uh, random experiments is not often done in economics, which is the reason that traditionally we're all familiar with which is economics, in many cases, it's impossible to do an experiment, right? Uh, for many practical reasons, we have, uh, you know, uh, we cannot run an experiment on monetary policy, obviously, uh, and uh, you can, for ethical reasons, you know, smoking, lung cancer, you cannot do random experiments, right? Um, and also just high dimensional. If your treatment is very high dimensional, or you have many high dimensional so-called effect modifiers you want to control, Right? then oftentimes it becomes impossible to do. Right. Okay. All right, so um, the, uh, so I already gave this, uh, I already talked about this point, which is uh, random experiment, even if we can do that, often give us a very local result, conditional on many fixed values of the effect modifier. Okay, so I will not, all right, so um, there are some other reasons why uh, random experiments often fail to give us what we're interested in. One very prominent uh, effect in economics is general equilibrium effect. And general equilibrium effect is very hard or impossible to get from typical random experiments. So what is the general equilibrium effect? Well, uh, as you can see here, also the slide title is getting up, which is a general equilibrium effect is a fact that often happens 
when the treatment become large scale. So on the scale of this treatment and apply to a huge part of the population, in that case, we, tip, we often have so-called generated effects. Example, okay, example. Um, suppose, all right, suppose we want to study, um, suppose I want to know what is the causal effect of, uh, let's say, college higher earnings. Again, the traditional classic example of uh, college education. So, if I just, let's imagine doing a random experiment in which I send some people to college and I force some other people to not go to college. That's unethical, but let's suppose we can do it. Does it tell me the causal effect of college on earnings? Maybe, okay. Suppose you tell me that doing so, we look at the two group of kids, children, and we see that people who go to college earn 20% more, okay? Suppose 20% more. Now the 20% represents a treatment effect. But can I take this treatment effect and just apply to everyone in the whole country? Just send every person to college in the whole country. And then can I expect their earnings to increase by 20%? If no, why not? What happens when you send everybody to college? What happens in that case? What do, what do we, you know, again, if you want to understand the causal effect, if you want to understand anything causal effect related, you have to understand the mechanism. Think about the mechanism. In terms of mechanism, what determines earnings, right? Remember that the, 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 the experiment is send people to college, and those people who go to college earn 20% more. So here the why is earning, okay? But what determines earning? What is the mechanism that determines earning? In economics. Come on, guys. <laughs> Supply demand, right? Okay. I hope everybody. So the reason why the reason why people earn higher wage when you go to college is become you, you become a high skilled labor, right? You can think about the economy as determined by supply and demand again, but here the demand is the demand for high skilled labor. And the supply is the college educated people, right? If you send everybody to college, what happens? The supply will increase like this, and the wage will go down, right? It's very simple, okay? So if, if everybody is college educated, then college becomes meaningless kind of, right? So of course, everybody is more educated, but then you're no longer special in a sense. So the equilibrium wage goes down. So the treatment effect no longer exists. And that's what we call the general equilibrium. Right? Okay? Now, if, if we do not send everybody to college, if I just send you know, like 10 people to college and observe another 10 people who don't go to college, then we're not going to change the equilibrium. So in that case, yes, it tells you something about the causal effect. But what kind of causal effect is that? That is the causal effect of sending people to college conditional on the supply curve and demand curve here, not changing, okay? As long as the supply curve changes and demand curve changes, that causal effect no longer holds. Right. So in other words, if I, you know, you can do, I know it's unethical, but suppose it's ethical, you can, you can truly do the experiment. Let's just send people to college and observe people and, and, and force other people to not go to college. You think you are doing a great experiment, but in the end, what are you getting? In the end, what you're getting is extremely local causal effect, which is the causal effect of sending somebody to college conditional on the supply and demand being here. Anything changes, your causal effect, you have to do ex the experiment again, right? Because, you know, if I no longer holds. So again, the point is, understanding the mechanism is important for understanding the causal effect, right? Okay, um, let's go back to the fumigation and yield example again, right? In fumigation and yield, um, you know, suppose we, we do the fumigation thing, right? The, the government did the fumigation randomized trial. And suppose we find out that fumigation increased the crop yield by 20%. So the government think, hey, it's a good thing uh, because fumigation increased crop yield. So let, let's, give fumigation, let's give fumigants for free to all the farmers in the country. <clears throat> Is that a good thing for the farmers or bad thing for the farmers? If the government give fumigants for free to all the farmers in the country based on this study, which is fumigation is good. Is it a good thing or bad thing? Why? Yeah, yeah, okay. So if I find, if the government, based on this study, if the government give free fumigants to all the farmers, so that every farmer has a 20% more crop, crop yield, what happens? In the crop, in the, in the barley market, the supply will go this way, right? So, um, so what, is the, what is the total income for farmers? 
this is the total income for farmers before the government gave them free fumigants. This is the total income for farmers after, right? In which case are they earning more? Do they earn more before or do they earn after the increasing supply? Depends on demand elasticity, okay? So if, if the demand for barley is inelastic, which it is for most, you know, for most essential crop, the demand is inelastic. So if the demand is inelastic, the farmers end up earning less than before, right? So giving them better technology, like a better fumigants, may be a bad idea. In fact, that's, you know, I think for some people who have attended my class before, I've told this story before, but this is the story of modern agriculture, right? So the story of modern agriculture is technology become better and better and better, but more and more people leave farming. They don't become farmers. Why? Because the total income farmers are decreasing. And the reason why is exactly because of this. When you increase, you know, when you increase uh, supply, the, the total earning actually decreases because the demand tends to be inelastic for very essential crops. But this is another example of general equilibrium effect, okay? which is when you apply any small scale treatment to a large population, the effect can be totally reversed due to the general equilibrium effect. And understanding that mechanism is very important to understanding whatever you're getting from a randomized experiment. Okay? Uh, the other, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the other uh, reason why oftentimes general uh, randomized experiments may fail to give us the desired causal effect uh, is something called sutra. Uh, the, 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 you know, the randomized, in order for a randomized experiment to, uh, to give us the correct sort of a, uh, you know, causal effect estimate, one assumption that we, we need to satisfy is that each individual who receive treatment or, or, uh, or uh, either receive treatment or control are independent. So if I give you the treatment versus give her the treatment, or versus, you know, versus how many people get treatment, it's all independent. Okay? Whether your outcome only depends on whether you receive the treatment or you do not receive the treatment. That's the assumption called a SUTFA, stable unit treatment value assumption. If that, treat, if that assumption is validated, but it, then you know, then we don't have the right results. What kind of situation violates so far? Well, any time there is interaction among the individuals. So that's an example. Okay, so this is a, a pure numerical example. Suppose the effect of treatment. Okay, so D is a you know zero one is the treatment, and we have three people in a population. Suppose um, the treatment effect on if one of them if only one received treatment. Versus if two people receive treatment, if versus if all three receive treatment, we'll have a very different outcome. Then we say suit five is violated. Right? Do people understand what's going on? So in other words, uh, one example would be uh, the treatment would be uh, you know, uh, let me see. Um, the treatment will be imagine the treatment is something like uh, uh, like individual tutoring service, okay? So we have a tutoring service provided to students. Now, if I just apply to one student, then the treatment effect on that student is one thing, okay? One thing. If I provide the tutoring service to two students, then after I provide to them, then more students have learned how to do things, and they can discuss with other students, then everybody can potentially have a higher payoff, okay? So the more, the more I provide this tutoring service to people in the group, the more everybody benefits because they can discuss with each other. So there's a spillover effect. And then whenever that happens, there's this interaction of spillover effects. The treatment effect is no longer independent. Okay? It depends on how many people in the population receive this treatment, not just whether this person has received treatment or not. If that's the case, the suitable assumption will be uh, you know, violated, and it, which means that you cannot analyze your experimental outcome the same way as uh, as if they are independent. Okay. Um, so this sort of is typically a concern uh, whenever people are doing experiments, whether there are any interaction effects among the subjects. Uh, you can think about Sutva as essentially a ID assumption of causal effects. Okay. Essentially, you know, if we assume that Sutva, we assume that individuals are all independent, no interaction, no spillover. In that case. Um, the, uh, essentially, we're assuming that the causal effects on each person are independent. Okay? So it's an IID assumption of causal effects. Now, um, Sutva, the Sutva, uh, 
you know, the, the, uh, the violation of Sutra means that uh, the, you know, we cannot analyze experiments just as before, you know, as if Sutra is satisfied. But unfortunately for economics, okay, Sutra is again an assumption that is often almost universally uh, dissatisfied, okay? Not satisfied. Why? Because economics, we study social, we study individuals, and the people are social animals. So they interact with each other, and they influence each other. There's always some spillover. And indeed, you can think about the general equilibrium effect that I was just talking about, right? The more supply and the equilibrium changes. You can think about the general equilibrium effect as extremely large scale sort of spillover effect, right? Because that's a result of individuals interacting in the market, okay? So because we are social science, and the, the subject we study are people who interact with each other, Sutra assumption is almost always violated in economics. Just the degree, okay, it's just about the degree. How much is it violated? If it's slightly violated, then we can tolerate it. If it's, it's significantly violated, then randomized experiment is not going to give you a very good answer. Okay, so the, the SP will get it from randomized experiments. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so that's all I want to say about uh, randomized experiment, right? So random experiments is indeed, uh, has long been considered the gold standard for causal inference. But like we said here, first of all, you need to understand the mechanism. Think very deeply about it, otherwise you're not getting much from random experiments. Second, for economics, for social science, where we study, the things we study often involve inter individual interaction and general equilibrium effects, random experiments offer, often offer a very limited solution to what we truly want. Okay. And thirdly, of course, you know, for all kinds of traditional reasons, right? you've all seen your textbooks, cost, ethics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? It's not possible it should be done. So that's why, in most cases, we focus on observational studies, and that's which will be the focus of uh, this lecture going forward. Okay. But before talking more about uh, our next uh, topic, let me just say, okay, uh, so, uh, for, uh, like I said, in order to understand, in, in order to understand or interpret any causal effect, we need an understanding of causal mechanism. And the causal mechanism only can only come from our prior knowledge. So prior knowledge is what we have before we do the experiment, or before we see the data, right? before we do any analysis. But where do, where do this prior knowledge come from? Well, this prior knowledge comes from previous analysis and studies that we have done. Okay? So it depends on previous data we have seen in the previous uh, causal inference we have done. So in other words, causal inference builds on causal inference, okay? All right, so we do some causal inference, we update our prior, and then we do inference again, and we update our prior. So it's really this process, a continual process of knowledge acquisition, uh, if we will. Okay, <clears throat> so, like I said, uh, the, uh, 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 in, the, you know, in the previous lectures, I introduced the Rubin causal model, which conceptualizes uh, the whole causal inference enterprise as that of a randomized experiment analogy. You can use experimental language to model causality. Like I also said, uh, the model has been criticized by some people uh, as de-emphasizing the role of mechanism, and, uh, and also in, in addition to some other obvious limitations. Uh, for example, in Rubin causal model, the X, the treatment, is typically discrete, right? Uh, no, X could be continuous, but oftentimes we envision, because the, the whole Rubin causal model is built on an, uh, experimental analogies. So X is either zero or one, or one, two, three, okay? You don't even have continuous treatment, which is kind of limited, right? Um, so for all that reason, the Rubin causal model is kind of limited in many ways. So starting today, uh, we're going to throw away the Rubin causal model, right? And we're going to introduce a new language for modeling causality and causal inverse. Uh, and this new language is called the causal graph model. Uh, okay, but before talking about causal graph model, let me begin by def defining what I call a causal model. Okay, what is a causal model anyway, right? We know statistical model. The statistical model is a what? What is, what is a statistical model? Remember in our introduction? Statistical model, a statistical model is a pure hypothesis set. Okay, it is a set of hypotheses. And, you can, you can, and each hypothesis is a statistical relation. It's a function, right? And then you can choose one of them to model, to find out what, is, what model is the, the data best. But what is a causal model? Right? If we have to find a causal model. Well, um, let's think about, uh, you know, the, let's think about this question. How to represent our knowledge of a causal mechanism? 
because, of, because the purpose of causal model is to represent our knowledge of causal mechanisms, right? Now, suppose I give, I'd like to say this, okay? Give you variable x and y. Suppose I tell you that um, a very simple, a very simple uh, sort of setup. X is the uniform distribution of 0, 1. And I say y is equal to 2x. Okay. Is this a causal model? This is not a causal model. This is only a statistical model. Because it models the relation, the joint distribution of x, y. Okay? It tells the joint distribution. It doesn't tell you anything causal related. Okay? However, we can turn this into a causal model by, uh, by changing. Let me just change the notation a little bit. Okay? Let me change it to uh, to this, okay? 2x goes to y. And by using this arrow, what I mean is that x causes y. Okay? Causes y. Or x leads to y. If I do that, I can make it, I think I can make this into a causal model. And a causal model has two ingredients. The first ingredient is Look, this is a causal model involved x and y, right? The first ingredient of the causal model is to tell us who causes who, okay? What is the causal relationship? Is it x cause y or y cause x? Here we say x cause y. What does x cause y actually mean? It means that if I, if x is, you know, if current, suppose x equal to 3, then y is equal to 6, okay? I'm sorry if you think we're back to kindergarten again, but, you know, 3 and a 6, all right? Now, X causes Y means if I manually, if I go in and I change the value of X, I change it to four, what, what is Y? Y is equal to eight, right? Okay. All right, so that means X causes Y. However, if I go in and I change, like I manipulate Y, if I change the Y, okay? So X equal three, Y equal six. If I go in and I change the value of Y, change it from six to seven, or maybe to eight, okay? Do the value of X change? No the value of x remains 3. Because why? Because y doesn't cause x, only x cause y. So that is the meaning of causality, right? Change x, it will make y change. Change y, it will not make x change. Okay? So that's why you should not write this. Okay? This equation, this, this equal sign is kind of bad because you know, it doesn't really, it, it says they are always equal to 2x. Two, two it doesn't really tell you who cause who. Once we write it this way, and it's clear, okay? It's x cos y. If I manipulate, if I manipulate x, y change. If I manipulate y, x does not change. So the first ingredient of a causal model is clearly defining the causal relation. The second ingredient is we also need a joint distribution specification. So a causal model incorporates a statistical model. The statistical model is part of a causal model, all right? So a causal model tells us the causal relation and also tells us how they are jointly distributed. Based on this, right, based on this setup, I know that x is uniform, and I know y is caused by x, so that is two x. So that I know that y is, you know, y is a uniform of zero, uh, two, for example, right, zero two. Then I know the joint distribution, and that's it. Okay. So uh, causal model has two ingredients: the causal relationship and the statistical relationship. Both are in the causal model. Okay. So that's what we define by strong causal models. Okay. So in summary, um, a causal model M is a set of random variables x2, x1 to xn. And uh, it is, has really two parts, okay? The first part is the joint distribution P, the joint distribution x2, xn. So that's just, that is the statistical model. So a causal model tells us what the joint distribution is. But it also tells us the causal structure. What do we mean by causal structure? Causal structure is the relationship the pure causal relationship between x and y. Okay. All right? So sometimes we can write m equal to uh, h and g. Okay? Sometimes I write it this way. m is a causal model. It has two parts. h is our statistical model. Suppose we have x and y, that h is the joint distribution, okay? the joint distribution of x and y. That is h. And G is the causal structure. And the causal structure is something that specifies their causal relationship, right? So for example, X cause Y, okay? Or Y cause X. This is the G, okay? So G specifies causal structure, 
and each specify the joint distribution. And together, they make a, a complete cosmology. Okay? All right. Now, um, if I am, if I am not interested, what if you say uh, I'm not interested in joint distribution? What if I only interested in their relationship? Only. I don't care about joint distribution. Okay. I just want to know this G, which is a causal structure. Then, okay. Then sometimes what we can do is we can represent this G using a causal diagram. Okay. Causal diagram. A causal diagram is a, is a simple diagram, it's like a drawing that represents the causal structure, which is a whole cause, whole cause. We can use a drawing. If we're not interesting, if we're not interested in the entire causal model, we can simply use a drawing to represent the causal structure. Because in that case, we don't need the joint distribution, right? So suppose so this is actually a drawing, right? X cause Y. It's a drawing. So if I have a if I have uh, x, y, z, if I have three variables, if I'm not interested in their joint distribution, I only want to know their causal structure, then I can simply make a drawing. Okay, I can say, okay, x causes y, all right? Y causes z, all right? Can z cause x? I hope not, otherwise it's a, right? Okay, so suppose that works. So x causes y, y causes z. That is my drawing. This drawing is called a causal diagram. Okay? It's a causal diagram. So if, we're, if we do not want to, if we do not want to specify the distribution, we can just use a diagram. And as I will show you, this causal diagram by itself is very, very powerful, from which we can derive many implications of how to propose it. Right? So that's very simple. Okay. So example. Okay. Now, suppose. All right. Suppose uh, we see a snake, a boa constructor. All right. Uh, that looks like this. So this is our observational data. Now I have a story. Right? I have a I have a causal story about why this is happening. Okay. So why is this happening? Well, this is happening because a, a snake, or, you know, a, a, a python, or whatever, right? A python has eaten an elephant. That's why we see something like this. Now the story that we see something like this is because this has happened. Is what? It's a causal model, right? It's our story, and our story is a causal explanation. For why we see this thing, we can dis we can use a causal model to describe this thing. Here it is. Okay, so the causal model. Now, a full causal model. Remember, a full causal model contains two parts. The first part is the description of joint distribution. The second is the causal relationship. So here, in order to describe my story, which is the snake has eaten the elephant, um, I need to specify everything for the for the complete causal model. I need to specify everything. I need to specify, uh, you know, the you know the length of the snake, the height of the snake, and I need to give a causal relation, which is, you know, once the snake has eaten the elephant, it becomes this. Otherwise, it's not, right? So anyway, sorry. And this is a serious model. You look at it. I mean, I, I spent some time on it. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so you can write a complete model to 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 describe this causal phenomenon, or you can just make a causal diagram, right? So this is a simple causal diagram. Elephant, snake, hat. Okay, elephant, snake. And this is what I mean by the causal diagram. Okay, next slide. So we are going to spend some time on what this causal diagram alone can tell us, and how to do causal inference based on simply reading the causal diagram without even specifying the joint distribution. All right. But before that, let me just say, um, remember in my introduction, I talk about structural estimation, right? I'm talking about structural model and the structural estimation. A structural model in economics, remember what is a structural model. A structural model is a model based on economic theory, okay? supply, demand, everything. And a structural model is a causal model. A, a, a complete economic structural model is a model that specifies the causal relationship and also specifies the joint distribution, everything. So it's like writing down a causal model like this. So whenever a, people, a person in economics do structural estimation, what that person is doing is, is estimating a complete causal model for the data, right? But oftentimes it's not necessary, okay? If you can, if you can do inference without specifying joint distribution, but only based on the causal structure, which is the causal diagram, uh, then oftentimes it can lead to a better result, as we will see, I'll show you very soon, okay? 
But let's focus now, let's do some introduction of causal diagram. Um, a causal diagram is also called a causal graph model or causal Bayesian network, right? Because the underlying structure is the Bayesian network. We're giving the causal reading to the Bayesian network. Now you see, okay, what is the Bayesian network? I don't have no idea about what the Bayesian network is. I don't have time, but you can read the appendix, okay, of the lecture slides. But let's, let's begin with a simple causal diagram. A causal diagram is a graph. The graph is used to re represent the underlying causal relationship, okay, the causal structure. Now, the points of the variables are x1 to xn. Okay, so we have x1 to xn with n variables in our model. On a causal diagram, each x is a node, okay? So I have x1, which is a node, x2, another node. So each one represents a node. Now, and there are direct link between them, right? Now, the key feature of causal diagram is that each link is what we call a directed edge. Okay? So it's a directed means we always have an arrow attached to it because we're using this to represent causality. Okay, so if I say x2 calls x1, there is an arrow points this way. If you know f x1 3 calls x1, there's an arrow point that way. Okay. Alright. Um, now some uh, for people who are familiar with graph theory and you know uh, graphs, these are all you know you're all familiar with this language. But if if x1, okay, so if x2 causes x1, we say, oh let's just go this way, okay? This is clear. So if x1 causes x2, x1 is called the parent of x2, okay? Um, and x1 causes x3, x, you know, this is called a parent, and this is called the children of the, of the parent. Now, if x3 goes to x4, from x1 to x4, right, I can go, I can go this direction, from x1 all the way to x4. So this is called a path, okay? It's called a path. So path is any time I can go from one node to the other. So for example, okay. suppose x1 goes to x2, and suppose there's something called x5 also goes to x2. Now, if I follow this x1 to x2 and x2 to x5, that is a path. However, in this path, as you notice, the causal direction is x1 to x2 and x5 to x2. In other words, when, when I go from x1 to x5, I'm not following uh, the causation directly, right? Because this is my, uh, you know, so x2 is the children, is the descendant of x1, but so is the descendant of x5. So if I go, but if, if I go along this path, from x1 to x3, x3 to x4, I'm always following the direction of the causality. So this kind of path is called a causal path. A causal path is a path that I'm able, I'm able to follow the link of uh, causality, okay? So in other words, this is caused by this, this is caused by this. And this kind of path is a non-causal path. Because we're not following that. Okay. A variable, now let's consider this whole thing as a simple graph. A variable that has no parents is called exogenous. And a variable with parents are endogenous. So this is called exogenous to the graph, and this is endogenous to the graph. Now, People in economics are very familiar with the idea of exogenated and endogenated economics. Okay? So what does endogenated exogenous economics have to do with exogenated and endogenous in this graph? I will explain. Okay, first there's some connection there. Okay? I will explain. Okay. Alright. Uh, now a causal diagram has to satisfy uh, causal Markov condition, completeness, faithfulness. You can read this condition by yourself. I'm not going to spend time on it. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. The, 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 the things I'm going to introduce now is more interesting, which is uh, if, if I give you a path P, right? Or any path. On a single path, there's something called a collider <coughs> if <coughs> so let's say I have x1, I have x2, x3, right? Now, if x1 goes to x2 and x3 goes to x2, right? Now, if I go from x1 to x3, 
this path. On this path, x2 is what's, what's called, first of all, this path is a non causal path. Right? People see that, okay? Then x2 is called a collider. A collider is any time there's an arrow in here and there's an arrow in here, right? So these arrows collide, okay? It's very simple. In this case, it's called a collider. Okay. Um, now I'm going to say is this path, a path is considered blocked, okay? It's blocked if there is a, um, uh, if there's a collider that has not been conditional. All right, so let me, let me explain what I mean here. Uh, x1, x2, x3, let's consider this case. Okay. All right, so just follow me here because I'm just introducing definitions and I'm going to give you examples later, okay? So don't worry if you're not following, following the reason why. Now, in this case, this x2 is not a collider, right? So we say this path is unblocked. Once there's a path in the collider, we say this path is blocked. However, I can block this path by what? Not, not, not by making the collider, okay? <laughs> we cannot change the causal relationship. But I can condition on x2. What do I mean by condition? Condition means fix x2. So x2 is a variable that has many different values. It's a random variable, okay? So x2 has many different values. When I fix x2 to, let's say, okay, condition on x2 equal to 1, for example. Okay? Let's fix the value of x2. If I do that, then I say this path is also called blocked. Now, again, you don't know the, you don't know what block means yet. Okay, I'm just introducing the definition. I'll be using this definition later. I'll give you some example later, so don't worry about it. Right now, just remember the definition of block is if there's a collider blocked, if there's a non-collider that has that's been conditional on also blocked. Okay, also blocked. Now, we say two variables are de-separated if all paths between them are blocked. Otherwise, they are deconnected. So uh, you know, I can give you any two variables on the graph, x1, and then there's xn. xn is any other variable. And there are many, many paths between them, OK? So if all of the variables, are, all of the paths are blocked, then we say they are de-separated. Okay? All definitions, all definitions. Probably meaning is to you now. So let's take a look at some examples and then we come back to what do block and deep connection deep separation means okay uh, let's consider these three basic relations between uh, ABC okay, variables A can go to C C can go to B this is called mediation now for this C A go to C B go to C this is called a mutual causation because A cause C and B cause C now in this case C cause A and C cause B this is called a mutual dependence or common cause so C here is a common cause of A and B C here is a common effect of A and B. Right, so that's a, some simple relation. OK, so I think I showed this in introduction already. right? So some of you have already familiar, we are already somewhat familiar uh, with what I'm going to talk about. But let's consider this case. Right? We have three variables, L, A, Y. Now, our causal relationship is L leads to L cause A and L cause Y. OK? All right, um, so in this case, L is called a common cause of A and Y. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, whether the um, let's talk about let's look at A and Y. For from A to Y, there is a path, right? There's a path like this. We can go to from A to L and L to Y. First question is L a collider or is L not a collider? Remember collider is what? Two arrow go this way. For this L it's two arrow go this way, right? So L is not a collider. Second question, is this path blocked? Again, two conditions for, for blockness. One condition is L is a collider, <coughs> that's blocked. But L is not a collider, okay? The second condition is L has been conditional. Here we are not doing any condition, okay? So it's not blocked. Because it's not blocked, it's not A and A and the Y are not de-separated. They are de-connected. Okay. So now let me ask the question. What about, in, uh, statistically, is A and Y correlated or are they independent? We actually did ex this example in the introduction already, if you remember. Is A and Y correlated or independent? 
Now, think about, let's think about example, okay? Let's consider, again, that's the same example I gave you in introduction. So people should remember, A is carrying a lighter, okay? Y is lung cancer, so it's extreme, but L is smoking. So smoking can cause you to have lung cancer. Smoking will also mean you carry a lighter, right? Okay, if you see a person, so carrying lighter and the lung cancer, are they correlated? If you see a person always carry a lighter, what do you think about that person? Is this person having a higher probability of lung cancer than another person who never carries a lighter? What do you think about that? Is it having a higher probability? It should, right? It should, okay? Because if smoking causes lung cancer, and if people who often carry a lighter means that person is likely to be a smoker, then people who carry a lighter is more likely to get lung cancer, right? So they have a higher correlation with lung cancer. Okay. So in other words, in this case, A and Y are statistically correlated. They have no causation with each other. A and Y has no causation, okay? Carrying a lighter doesn't cause lung cancer. And lung cancer doesn't cause you to have carry a lighter. So there's no causation between the two, but they are correlated as a result of Y, as a result of this structure of causation. So as we will learn, okay? So A and Y, like I said, is D, they're, they're D-connected, they're not D-separated. As we will learn, D-connected often means what? D-connected actually implies that A and Y are correlated. And D-separated means A and Y are independent. Okay, so as we will obviously see more example on that. Let's take a look at this example. Okay. So now uh, A goes to L, and a Y goes to L. So L is a common effect, right? Example, A, having a family heart disease history, okay? Uh, L, heart disease, and a Y is smoking. So we're supposing that smoking can cause heart disease. I don't know, but let's just suppose, okay? Suppose smoking causes heart disease. Let's suppose family history causes heart disease. So that's A and a Y, right? Question, is A and a Y correlated or independent? In this case, they both lead to uh, what is that? They both lead to heart disease, but do family heart history and smoking, are they correlated? No, they're independent, okay? They're independent. So th in this case, A and Y are independent. In the case like this, A and Y are correlated. All right. Okay, so also now let's take a look at this, this, this whole graph, all right? What is the path from A to Y? From A to Y, we have to go to A to L, and L to Y, right? So what is this L? Sorry. We go from A to L and L to Y. So this L is a collider, okay? Right? This goes this way. So when a path contains a collider, we say this path is blocked. And when the only path between them is blocked, we say these two variables are de-separated. And as you can see, these separated variables are independent. They're independent. Right, okay. All right. More example, okay? Let's forget about this one, all right? Just, just look at this one, okay? So, this is just like the previous example, okay? The first example. L goes to A, L goes to Y. All right, uh, you know, smoking, carrying a lighter, smoking, lung cancer. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to condition on L. Condition means fix the level of L, okay? Fix the level of L. Um, how do I condition? Uh, remember, L is, uh, L is smoking. So by conditional smoking, what I mean is I only look at people, uh, let me see, suppose, all right, suppose I only look at people who never smoke, who do not smoke. So that's called condition, right? Condition on L equal to zero. Only look at people who do not smoke. If I only look at people who do not smoke, does carrying a lighter and a lung cancer correlate? Are they correlated? If you only look at people who never smoke, you know they never smoke, and you see a person always carrying lighter. I don't know for, I don't know why, right? But <laughs> if a person always carrying lighter. Okay. So, can we infer that this person has a high probability of lung cancer? No, right? It's no longer. Okay. Because, because why? Because in that case, the carrying a lighter doesn't mean that he smoke. Right. Previously, the causation goes right. Previously, the causation is you see somebody carrying a lighter. 
we infer that this person more likely to smoke, and then you infer this person more and more likely to have bad habits. And now we know that the person never smoked. So seeing the information of parent life doesn't mean anything anymore. So A and a Y become independent. Uh, independent. All right. Okay. All right. So A and Y are now independent. So once we condition on the common cause, because L is a common cause. Once we condition on common cause, the correlation disappears. They become independent. Now let's take a look at the path again, okay? So the path from A to Y is A, L to Y. Now we know that L is not a collider, so this path is not blocked, it's open. However, remember what I said. If I condition on something that is not a collider, I will, I will actually what? I will actually block the path. Okay? Anytime you condition on a non-collider, you end up blocking the path again. So this path is again blocked. So by condition on L, I am blocking the path again. And once they're blocked, A and Y become de-separated, and then they become independent. Okay? So that's really the story. Um, what about, okay? What about I condition on the common effect? What about I condition on the collider? What happens? So now L is collider, okay? It's a common effect. If I condition on L, do A and Y become correlated or independent? They become correlated again. Without condition on L, A and Y are independent, remember. But once I condition on it, A and Y will become correlated again. Let me, I, I, I'll give you some more but the story is, if I condition on a collider, it unblocks the path. Okay, it's really simple. Okay, so the path story is this: A, and, you know, from from x one to x two, so uh, x three. Okay, so if I go like this, x two to x three, if I go like this, this path is open. There's no collider. This path is open. Once I condition on it, the path becomes blocked. Okay, now. On the other hand, if I have this one, x2, this x2 is a collider. So this path is blocked. It's not open. But once I condition on it, this path is open. It's no longer blocked. All right? And uh, if two variables, if, if, two, if the two variables are completely blocked on every path, they are de-separated. If they're de-separated, they're independent. If two variables are not completely blocked, there is a path that's open that they are deconnected, and if they're deconnected, they're correlated. Okay, so that's the story. Now let's come back to this one. Why, why conditional L make them correlated? Think again. Okay, let's let's example, right? So um, so here's the here's the example. I think you know. Well, I think we actually have already seen, right? Um, so if people are admitted to college based on two variables, one is their interview score, one is their exam score. And let's just suppose they are not uncorrelated, okay? Let's suppose these two are completely uncorrelated. Now, I can get into college if I have a high interview score, or if I get into college if I have a high exam score. The, 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 final, the final score is interview plus exam. If they plus, if they're higher than a threshold, that's it. If it's lower than a threshold, you are not in, right? Okay, so in the end, these people will be in, okay? Right, people see that? So this is the, all the pool of applicants. But only these people will be in because for these people, either they have a higher interview score or they have a higher exam score. Or both, okay? Or both. But if we only look at, so, okay, right? All right. So, how do we represent this using a causal diagram? Well, um, interview, right? If I have a good interview, accept. So, if I have a good interview, I might get accepted. If I have a good uh, exam, I may get, that will also may get me accepted, right? So this accept is the common effect. And it's also collided, okay? It's also collided. If I condition on acceptance, meaning, for example, if I only look at people who are accepted, then these two variables will become correlated. Interview, interview score and exam score will become correlated. Do people see that? Okay, right. Look at here. 
interview, if we only look at people who are accepted, that interview and the exam score are positive or negative correlated. They're positive or negative correlated. <laughs> negative, right? It goes this way, okay? They're negatively correlated. Once we condition. Without condition, okay? Without if we look at the entire sample, they are uncorrelated. Right? So just like if we without conditioning, if we do not condition, they are uncorrelated, okay? Because this path is blocked by the collider. So they are independent. So they're uncorrelated. But once we condition on it, we make this path open. So they become correlated. And in this case, it's a negative correlation. So this is actually very important. All right? This is a very important point. Uh, if you condition on a collider, or if you condition on common effect, you make two variables correlated. This is actually a very, very important point. Um, many people in economics, uh, you know, when they do research, they often make a mistake called the survival bias. I'm not sure if people have heard of that. But the survival bias is essentially this, okay? So let me explain. Um, what ha suppose I do a study of, um, you know, of I want to see what is the effect of, uh, suppose I'm studying, you know, fund competition, okay? So there's many mutual funds. And I'm looking at uh, the mutual fund performance versus the size of the mutual fund, right? Okay, I say, well, is the, the larger size, is the larger size mutual fund give me higher return or lower return? Um, if I do a study like that, okay, and there are very good studies uh, published in very good journals doing something like this, which is to study the, the size of mutual fund on mutual fund performance, and I, and I find that larger size is actually leads to lower performance, okay? So larger size fund give you lower return. Uh, any problem with this kind of research? If the data they use is based on current existing mutual fund. Any problem with that? The problem is that the, mute, the fund they study are the fund that survive. Okay? Are the fund that, that live on, okay? Do not close. Now, let's think about it. Suppose, I'm just going to, I'm going to suppose, right? I'm not a financial economist, so this is not my area. But let me just suppose. Suppose large size makes you easy to survive. Survive, all right? As a, as a fund, okay? If your size is larger, you are, you know, you are more robust to, uh, to shocks, so you make it easier for you to survive. Now suppose also if you have a high return, okay? Return on equity is high, or return on asset is high, then it's more likely to survive. So if your performance is good, you're more likely to survive. If your size is large, you're more likely to survive. All right? And then suppose we do our analysis only on firms that have survived. What is that? We are conditional on survival equal to one, right? So we are actually conditioning on a common effect, which will what? Which will make them correlated even if there's no causation, right? So even if there's no causation, they will become correlated. And they will have a negative correlation. Just like, just like you, right? They will have a negative correlation. Because why? Because how do you survive? Either you have big size, or you have exceptionally good performance. So if you have big size, you're, you're likely, if you, in the data, if you have big size, you're unlikely to have a, a good performance at the same time. If you have particularly good performance, you're unlikely to have big size together, right? So it's a negative correlation. So in other words, in, in study, in, you know, in the study I was just talking about, uh, you know, if the author finds a negative correlation, a negative effect of size on performance, maybe the negative effect comes from this, okay, rather than from true causal effect. Right? So this is a very important point that you should remember. Right? Condition on cause common effect or condition on a collider opens up, okay, opens up a path and then make variables correlated with each other. Okay. So in summary, or in summary. There are three structural reasons, three reasons why two variables may be correlated. Uh, here I use the word associated, but you know, it's the same thing, okay? Correlated, associated, dependence, or whatever. Um, there, are, there are three reasons why two variables are correlated with each other. The first reason is x goes to y, okay? Right. So this is, a, this is the simplest reason. If there's a causation, of course they're correlated. 
The second reason is there is something called z that goes to x and it goes to y. If that's the case, x and y is also correlated. Because why? Because there is a common cause, or in graph terms, there is an open path. When there's an open path, they are deconnected. They are not deseparated. They are correlated. Okay. Now, the third reason is x goes to z, x goes to z, y goes to z. But in this in this case, no worry because uh, z is a collider, so this path is blocked. So they are independent. They are not correlated. But whatever. But what if I condition on it? Then that makes x and y correlated. So these are the three reasons x and y. Uh, correlated. Okay, so correlated. Now, before talking more detail about causal analysis, let me just say the extremely simple strategy of getting causality out of observational data is this. Okay, so let's go back to uh, let's take a look at this picture, right? Okay, so L poses A, L poses Y. Now, oh, I actually know this picture, right? So A and Y in this case, right? If, if this is observational data. Not uh, experimental data, right? Observation data. So I know that L plus is A, L plus is Y. Can now um, let me just change this picture a tiny little bit. Okay. So I know that L causes A, and I know L causes Y. All right. Now let me just change the picture a little bit. Let me just say I am not sure. I'm not sure whether A causes Y. Maybe. Okay, so maybe A causes I know Y doesn't cause X. But I'm interested in whether A has a causal effect on Y. This is I know. This is what I'm trying to find out. I'm not sure. If that's the case, can I infer the causality from correlation between A and Y? So if I, because A and Y are correlated, if I see A and Y are correlated, does this correlation tell me causality? Because you're yeah, right. No, right? The correlation between x and y doesn't tell me the causation. And the reason is very simple. Because even without causation, they are correlated. Right? Even without causation, they are correlated. OK. So what should I do to get the causation out? Well, the simplest strategy here is to condition on L. Why? Because once I condition on L, what happens? If I condition on L, first thing, I, you know, in graph language, I block this path so that A and X and Y are not correlated if there's no causation. So if there's no direct causation, X and Y, uh, A and Y, sorry. If there's no direct causation, A and Y will be uncorrelated. So in that case, if I still see some correlation, if I still see they are correlated, it must be because there is a correlation. Okay. All right. So it's really simple. So the basic strategy of getting causation out of observational study is to make x and y. Okay. Is to make x and y de-separated, meaning independent, without a direct link. If without a direct causal link, they are independent. Then I know that any correlation I observe in the data must be because of the correlation. So that is the basic strategy of doing causal effects. All right? Okay? Are people clear on that? All right? So in the end, as we see, okay, I will see. Any time, you know, you, uh, I think we're running out of time today, but uh, as a summary, okay, because we're going to more detail, much more detail next class on all kinds of uh, things that we can do with the graph. But today, let me just end on a, on a simple uh, summary. First of all, to do causal inference, we need to understand the causal mechanism. Mm -hmm. Understanding the causal mechanism is a, is a prerequisite for doing causal inference. And then where does the mechanism come from? It comes from our prior knowledge. Okay. And then in this case, when I want to do causal inference from using this graph, when I want to do causal inference, I need my prior knowledge of what the diagram looks like. Okay, so what the diagram look like? Where does it come from? It comes from my prior knowledge about the underlying mechanism. Right, first thing. Second thing, in the end, any ability to extract causality from data comes down to what? Comes down to our ability to transform correlation into causation. 
because correlation is all we see in the real world. The real world doesn't, you know, doesn't have, right? So <coughs> correlation is all we see from the data. So anytime you want to get causality out of the data, the prerequisite is to understand in what situation correlation means causation. If we know in what situation correlation means causation, then we get better. Because then we can infer causality from correlation. Right. So causal inference, a large part of causal inference, causal inference is about trying to get to the, you know, trying to infer what kind of situation in which correlation uh, imply causation, and in which situation it does not. So in this simple example, we know that once we control, or once we condition on L, that any remaining correlation between X and Y has to mean causation. So in this case, we're confident that correlation is causation. Okay, so in the end, causation comes from observational correlation, right? because data tells us only correlation. So two things give us causation. The first thing that gives us causation is prior knowledge. Based on prior knowledge, prior knowledge of mechanism. Prior knowledge of mechanism. So this is the first requ requirement for causal inference. Without prior knowledge of mechanism, all causal inference is, 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 is mute, okay? Is, is meaningless. The second is based on this prior knowledge of causal mechanism, how to transform, how to transform our correlation, okay, into or actually actually let me a better way to say they how to express our causality in terms of correlation, okay? In terms of correlation. So that's the second step. It's a prior knowledge mechanism. Is about how to express our interested, you know, our target causal effect in terms of correlation that we can actually see from data. These are general two steps. Um, so in the next class, we'll go to more, much more detail, okay, about how to do things. Uh, but let's just end today, and uh, we'll see each other on Thursday. And uh, I will also mention the makeup class very soon, I promise, in the group, okay? All right, so let's call it a day. <laughs>